Welcome, and we are delighted here at Idlewild Community Church that you've joined us online to worship and to connect with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Psalm 95 is a great psalm of worship, and it gives us the admonition, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. And then it goes on to say, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. So we invite you today to worship and to kneel and to listen knowing that some of the the words that God will speak will be challenging words, and they're going to call for change. Change of our schedule, of our relationships, of our finances, uh, of our values and priorities and patterns in life. And and God's Word is calling us to change uh, in order to fashion us after His likeness. And unless we're willing to listen, we'll end up giving ourselves to a God fashioned after our own image. And the last time I checked, that's called an idol. So I invite you to bring your heart and a willingness to worship and listen and change. Let's worship, shall we? He is jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of His wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And a real Oh 
Let us pray. Dear Lord, our God, we come to you with gratitude and praise. Thank you for answers to our prayers. We are so grateful for our thrift shop volunteers and for the blessings this ministry brings to our community and missionaries around the world. We pray you will bring more volunteers. We continue to pray for those overseeing and working at the thrift shop. We lift up those who have lingering COVID symptoms and we pray for these symptoms to depart. We pray those who are rehabbing do not become discouraged and are able to get well soon. The son of a longtime member was involved in a serious bicycle accident. He has a brain bleed and a broken leg. He has spoken and is up and walking, and we praise you. We pray for mental clarity and that you will give the doctors success as they treat him and that he will return to full health soon. The wife of a Mexico missionary couple who run an orphanage is improving. Her depression and anxiety have decreased. We praise you. We pray you would remove her pseudodementia and bring healing and wholeness. Lord, we praise you for sending your son to us and the sacrifice he made so our relationship with you could be restored. We lift up these prayers before you. A retired teacher and longtime Hill resident passed away several days ago after a brief stay in hospice. May your peace and comfort rest on her children, family, and friends. The son of a congregant is suffering from constant pain. He is able to work out some, and we pray the endorphins provide some relief. May he feel encouraged by your spirit, and may you bring healing and wholeness. The husband of a member has COVID and stomach problems. He is in rehab and visitors are not allowed. We pray for encouragement and recovery and that you will provide his living arrangements after release from rehab. A man who has an appendix enlarged is also despondent. He has received a recently experienced poor memory, physical weakness, and increased confusion. We pray for energy and mental focus and that he will begin talking more. A congregant has masses in her thyroid, trachea, and chest. Doctors aren't sure what they are, and testing is being delayed. We pray for testing to occur soon and for you to guide the healing of her body. We pray for peace and comfort for those who lost pets, homes, and property in the Boulder Fire. We pray for a nephew who is gravitating away from you. We pray for your spirit to provide direction and that better decision-making results. A man has pancreatic cancer. We pray for treatment, healing, and a return to full health. We lift up the local arts school. We pray for more students, faculty, and staff to draw near to you, to know you and love you more deeply. We pray for families and new members to join our congregation. We lift up this nation and its leaders. We pray for your wisdom, discernment, compassion, love, and integrity on our leaders and that they would guide this nation according to your will, returning us to the principles upon which this country was founded with you at the center. We pray for revival in this world. We pray for friends and family who do not yet know your Son to be drawn near and near to you, claiming Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we may love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind. May we continue to trust in you. We pause now for silent prayer. Lord, we close this time of prayer by praying as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we took most of last year, 2021, going through the Gospel of Mark and the Book of Acts. And we did that just one chapter uh, each week. And so when we concluded, it's time for a new series. And I began to seek God, oh, November or so, uh, just regarding what kind of focus should be next. Where would we go in our next series? And there's actually a lot of options available to us in a new series. We could just continue the chapter a week format, just choose a, a different book, maybe an Old Testament book. Or we could focus, say, on an individual in the Scripture and do a character study, uh, just sort of trace their, their story uh, and their development. I mean, it could be Abraham or Jacob or David or Moses. Uh, or we could look at a certain topic, say, hope or trials or relationships or eternal life. I decided instead to do an extended series on the book of 1 Peter. And what's going to be different about this particular series than last year's one chapter per week format uh, is that we're going to take just a few verses each week from 1 Peter so that we won't miss anything and just do a little bit more of a deeper dive uh, than we were able to last year. So, as we start, I need to warn you, uh, we're going to do the background of the book today, so we won't get very far into it. In fact, we'll probably only get the first half of the first verse. So, if that was the rate we were going uh, at in the entire series, it'd take two, three, four years to finish this five-chapter book. So, no, we're, we're going to move a little bit more quickly in the coming weeks, but today it's just the background. So if you were to ask, why First Peter? Why, why focus on, on that particular book? Well, I think it, mostly it's because of who wrote it, and then secondly, when he wrote it. Okay, who wrote it? Peter, the apostle. Peter, the disciple. No one in history has spent more time in the direct presence of Jesus Christ than Peter. I mean, we took a year to go through the Gospel of Mark and the book of Acts, and Peter's right there in the middle of it, in the thick of it all in the Gospel of Mark, and he is Jesus' point man for the first half of the book of Acts. So all of the words that we've got in red in our Bible, those words that are directly spoken by Jesus, Peter heard them all, and he heard them the first time that they were spoken, the, the, the original context. So he was able to, to not only hear the words, but he could catch the tone in Jesus' voice, saw the, the look on his face and the reaction of the crowd. So he adds that kind of depth to uh, his writing. Peter had more conversations with Jesus Christ than any human being. And not only when it comes to the words of Jesus, but Peter was an eyewitness to everything that Jesus did in public, as well as being a part of the inner circle that really saw a great deal more than what went on in public. I mean, the breadth of Peter's exposure to the words and to the ministry of Jesus, it's just, it's stunning. The blind, the lame, the demon-possessed, the afflicted, they're all healed. Jesus turns water into wine. He walks on the water. He, he feeds a multitude with fish and loaves. He raises the dead. And Peter gets a front row seat to all of that. I mean, up close and personal. And if he had any questions about what he saw, he could ask Jesus about it. So here's a man who's got more stories about Jesus Christ than anyone else. I mean, he's right there. When Jesus was transfigured, Peter alone joins Jesus to walk on the stormy seas. Peter hears Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter uh, saw Jesus raise people from the dead. And Peter saw Jesus after he was raised from the dead. And Peter 
experienced a, a personal restoration in a breach of relationship that occurred when Peter denied, denied Jesus. So Peter, along with all of the apostles, the, he gets the final glimpse of Jesus as he ascends into heaven. And then after the Gospels conclude and the book of Acts begin, it's Peter that Jesus selects to be the initial point man as the Gospel just takes off after Christ's ascension. He experiences to the, the mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And Jesus chooses him to preach the very first sermon of the church. He preaches it and thousands respond in faith. And in sh a short time later, thousands more will come to faith uh, in the aftermath of a healing that Peter and John did on a man that had never walked in his life. And then he preached to the vast crowd that had gathered to, to see the aftermath of that miracle. Then later in the book of Acts, G Peter is asked to pray over the deceased body of a faithful disciple named Tabitha and his words and his actions and his prayers. Raise her from the dead. And then later, his obedient venture into the house of a Roman centurion named Cornelius, it opens the door, the gospel, to Gentiles that had previously been closed. I mean, the, the extent of Peter's exposure to all that Christ was doing, it's breathtaking. And so, in the decades after the, the end of the book of Acts, in all those decades, Peter, he remains true in his church leadership, in his walk with Christ, despite the storms and the opposition. So, you want to hear what this man has to say. It's like getting an inside scoop. So, is it any wonder that Peter's two letters are among the most beloved letters of the Bible. But it's not just Peter's exposure to Christ that has us wanting to read this book. It's also his personality. His personality was just a draw. Peter is a natural leader. I mean, he's in the center of, of, of every crowd. People in his day were just drawn to his confidence and his boldness. I mean, Peter, he's a magnet. But you know, like a magnet, Peter can not only attract, <laughs> he can also repel. I mean, at times he's loud and boisterous and opinionated and obnoxious. And he speaks before he thinks. He rubs you the wrong way. And at times he's got you just shaking your head and rolling your eyes. It's Peter that has the audacity to try to talk Jesus Christ out of going to the cross. Tries to talk Jesus about, uh, out of washing uh, his feet at the Last Supper. Hey, Peter, he's volatile, he's impetuous, he's impulsive, opinionated, vacillating. I mean, he boldly declares that he'll die for Christ if need be, and then hours later he's cussing like a sailor, denying that he even knows him. Peter is so human. He is so beloved because he's so like us in so many ways. I mean, Jesus is constantly having to correct Peter. And yet, Jesus stays with him through all the corrections. I mean, not only when Peter fumbles the ball, but when he runs in the wrong direction and scores for the other team, Jesus is still there. So, yes, we're drawn to this letter because of the, the man who wrote it and the Christ who loved him. But there's a second reason why we're drawn to this letter. It's not only who wrote it, but when it was written. I mean, n no one would want to read anything that Peter wrote when he was young, when he was raw, green, self-opinionated. No, we love this letter because Peter writes it as a seasoned pastor with decades of walking with Christ under his belt. I mean, in the very beginning when he meets Christ, Peter's a mess. He's a spiritual mess, but he doesn't remain a spiritual mess. Over the years, he responded to Christ's admonitions, and he changed. He grew. He deepened. He, he seasoned beautifully. He didn't stay in the same place. So when he writes this letter, 
He's undergone massive, consistent life change. He was willing to let God just engage in the process of knocking off a lot of rough edges. And you get a clue that Jesus had all of that in mind the very first time that he met Peter when that first meeting uh, is recorded in the Gospel of John, it says this, Andrew found first his own brother Simon and said to him, we found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you're Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which translated Peter. When it says that Peter, or when Jesus looked at Peter when they first met, it's not just a superficial gaze. It's a piercing gaze. For Jesus was not only able to see what everyone else saw, but discerns what Peter is capable of becoming in the years to come as he's exposed more and more to Jesus. So Jesus sees that Peter, he's willing. He's willing to be shaped and molded and infused and broken and reformed. He can see that. And Jesus renaming him from Simon to Peter really points to the change that Jesus intends to work in this man's life, to make him from a fisherman to a fisher of men. From a man that was just engaged in a common profession with a very foul mouth to a life that was devoted to helping people come into an eternal relationship with Christ and whose words would change the eternal trajectory of thousands. You know, it's as if Jesus was saying, I'm not just changing your name. I'm changing your life, your temperament, your eternity. I mean, we love this letter because it, it's a clue revealing what we might become one day in the shaping hands of a patient and powerful Savior who's committed to us growing, who is committed to deepening us, even though that involves a process that will take decades for throughout the remainder of our lives with all kinds of highs and lows and the kind of quality of change that Jesus is committed to uh, to bringing not only to Peter, it's, it's a, a symbol of what he wants to bring in us. That's why we love this book. It works. To a man who is known for his impulsiveness and his fluctuation, Jesus renames him the rock. Solid, unmovable, weighty. That's what Peter means. We love this letter because of, of the change that, that happened in Peter's life, the pastoral warmth, the the grace, the encouragement, the depth. This letter, it's proof that God the Father answered Jesus' prayer for Peter at the Last Supper in the upper room when Jesus told Peter, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when once you've turned again, Strengthen your brothers. This letter, decades after that prayer, proves that Peter's faith had recovered and that he had grown in the areas of being able to strengthen other people in their faith and in our faith. We love this letter because of who writes it and when he wrote it, not at the beginning of his life, but near the end of his life. So we we love it not only because Peter writes it uh, in terms of his timeline near the end, but we also love it in terms of the the historical timeline in which it is written. I mean, Peter's first letter, it's written to Christians who are in jeopardy of their lives. On July 19th, in the year 64 AD, there was a terrible, devastating fire that broke out in the city of Rome. The narrow streets and the the wooden tenements, uh, it enabled that fire to spread quite rapidly. And it burned for three days. 
raging and consuming neighborhood after neighborhood. And when it was about 75% contained at the end of three days, it broke out again with greater intensity in places of that city, upwind from many blowing embers. This fire is no accident. It's, it's arson, plain and simple. And the average person on the street had no doubt that it was arson, and they had no doubt as to who was behind it. The populace believed it was their own Emperor Nero, who started this fire. Nero was known for having a passion uh, to build. And Rome was already built out, and so the rumor was that he just wanted to destroy it all so that there would be building. People also knew that he was not exactly what you would call emotionally stable. And they also knew that there were individuals sent by the government who deliberately hindered those who were trying to fight the fire. So rumors were swirling after that devastating fire and the the pain and the heartache that that occurred after it. Resentment and bitterness really begins to intensify. Nero, he's got to divert suspicion from himself. So he officially blames this new cult called Christianity. Uh, Up to that point, Christianity uh, had been a permitted religion by Rome, but all of that changed. And there began a, a savage outbreak of persecution. And yet Christians martyred in the most sadistic of ways. They would be covered with pitch, attached to a pole, and set ablaze, and then used as human torches to light Nero's garden parties. Some Christians were were sewn up in skins of wild animals and then set upon by hunting dogs who would tear them limb from limb and and eat them alive. The savagery was demonic. So Peter is writing a letter when God's people are facing a very severe storm. They're taking a beating. They're being jailed and martyred one by one by one. And the church, it just needs encouragement. And Peter's the one who needs to bring it. So he begins his letter. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, Peter's the one who should be writing this letter to encourage oppressed believers. I mean, no one has experienced more of Christ and therefore no one is better equipped to bring the comfort of Christ than than Peter. Remember many years ago now, just immediately following 9-11, our nation was in absolute shock and we were stunned and there was a nationally televised service of consolation that was led by Billy Graham. We needed to hear him. We needed to hear his voice. He could speak in ways that no politician could. And his words would touch areas of our lives and our souls that no politician could. Well, that same kind of dynamic is at work in the first century among these persecuted believers whenever they hear from Peter. So he begins identifying himself with the name that Jesus gave him, not the name that his parents gave him. Peter, not Simon. And so doing, he brings to mind the solidity that Jesus has been working in his life over the decades. I mean, all Peter has to do to get an attentive audience among these storm-ravaged believers is just tell them right out of the gate, it's Peter. It's Peter. Because that name inspires courage and hope. His audience knows that he Peter has experienced his share of threats from powerful people and times of very severe persecution in his own life over the last 30 years. He'd been in and out of prison. Peter has survived many a storm for Christ and he's remained true and growing during that whole time. So, in the weeks to come, we'll look at what Peter has to say specifically in this letter But let me move toward a conclusion today with a quote from a pastor, theologian, a commentator named William Barclay. The theological ideas of 1 Peter 
are exactly the same as those we find in the recorded sermons of Peter in the early chapters of Acts. In other words, in this letter, 1 Peter, he's giving counsel based on beliefs that he has held dear and preached for decades. He has not wavered. He has not wandered. Peter remained true to his original calling. There's been no mission drift. His ending is as true to the beginning as it could be. He's finishing well. And so few people in the Bible do that. So Peter's preaching in the, in the preaching of the early church is really based on five main ideas. The first of which is that Jesus ushered in a whole new era called the kingdom of God. It's an era that had been prophesied to one day come in the Old Testament. The prophecies were there. Well, Jesus brought in a down payment, a guarantee of that, that kingdom. Uh, and so we get a taste of the redemption, the salvation that we will experience fully one day uh, in the age to come. I mean, Peter heard Jesus publicly say many times, and in fact, the first public words of Jesus in ministry are, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's right here, right now. I bring it. So you need to repent and believe the gospel. So that's the first thing that Peter and the early disciples preached vehemently. Secondly, that this new era of the kingdom ushered in by Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, it was the result of a plan that God had always put in place. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, they're not an accident. They're not an afterthought. But they're a part of, well, what Peter calls in the Sermon on Pentecost, the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. As everything is unfolding and as it continues to unfold, it's all unfolding according to the God's plan. That, that's the second thing, that they confidently and joyfully preach. Thirdly, that by virtue of his resurrection, Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of God and he is the leader of God's people. He is the head of of the church. He's the one that we all look to as the leader of God's people. Fourthly, Jesus is coming again in glory to judge the living and the dead. That the glory, the beauty, the fullness of God's kingdom in the age to come that was prophesied in the Old Testament, uh, well, that Jesus brought in in terms of a certain degree at his first coming, uh, it's going to be ushered in completely at his second coming. And when that happens, Jesus will divide humanity into two. And Peter heard Jesus teach this time and time again in multiple parables and just in plain language that humanity will be divided into two. Jesus is the one who will be doing that division. And on one hand, there will be those who are the blood-bought children of Christ who have placed their faith and their eternity in His hands. That's on the one side. And on the other, those who tried the self-redemption plan, if they tried anything at all, in terms of their souls and their eternity. And it's not going to work. And so because all of that is true, the fifth major teaching of the early church is that God's offer of forgiveness and redemption and eternal life through Jesus, it requires a response on our part. The first words from the lips of Jesus as he began his public ministry, uh, you know, the, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is, hand, is at hand, repent and believe, repent. The in the first sermon on the day of Pentecost, Peter passionately pleads, pleads with that vast crowd, repent. And this word repent doesn't so much mean that you're sorry for something, but it means that you're changing. It means you're going in one direction, you've changed, and you go in a different direction. Well, that's the description of Peter's whole life. It was just one continual change. His was a lifelong repentance and growth. And Peter is writing to these uh, batter believers, inviting them into the same kind of life, the same kind of faith, as difficult uh, as the circumstances may be to continue their life of growth. 
So we're going to encounter again and again in the coming weeks just the warmth of Peter's counsel to these storm-tossed believers. And really in conclusion, this letter tells us that God's made an investment in your earthly life and in your eternity. And it's a steep investment. It's the life of His own Son. Given that you and I might experience freedom from sins as they're forgiven, to experience the joy of just a deep connection with God, and to know the wonder of experiencing aspects of this age to come in the here and now. And, and to experience the solidity of being just in the flow of an unfolding plan that God has had for you from before you were even born. God's track record of staying with Peter over the years, despite Peter's failings, that should provide tremendous comfort to us and inspiration for us just to hang in there no matter what the circumstances are. And yes, being an out-and-out -out Christian in our day, it's getting more and more difficult. The, the path, it's, it's getting more uphill. And we need strength. We need the strength that Peter writes about in his letter. So I would invite you over the next weeks just to pull out near the last of the Bible. It's this little five-chapter book of 1 Peter. And just read it and, and allow your heart to soak in what it is that God is trying to say through this beautiful, aged apostle who seeks to bring comfort to you and to me. Preparing for that, let's pray, shall we? Lord God, there is so much that you did in the life of Peter that we're praying that you would do in our lives to take us and shape us and mold us as we encounter you more and more, your words and your actions in our day. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, that at the end of this series, having really dove into this book in depth, that we're going to come out different people than we came into it with. And we know that we're going to need the, the strength and the guidance and the direction of your Holy Spirit if that's going to happen. And so we will humbly ask that your Holy Spirit would, would do in us and open our hearts up in the same kind of way that we've seen happen in the life of this, this beautiful man named Peter. He followed you. We seek to do the same. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.